Well, let's talk about some bearings. Uh, we are moving into chapter 11 in the textbook. Um, and uh, so this is a, a really common machine element that you have probably seen in several different contexts. Uh, elements, uh, machine elements where we use rolling uh, elements like that can either usually be balls or s little cylindrical um, parts or even cone-shaped parts um, and set them up in such a way as you allow a bearing to roll. So we're very familiar with these ball bearings, roller bearings, needle bearings. Um, these are all examples of these rolling element bearings. Uh, wanted to kind of talk about some of the terminology just a little bit with respect to bearings so that you know you've got a little bit of background that way. Um, first of all, uh, what, what generally composes a bearing are kind of three different things. One is the inner race, and so I have that labeled over here. Um, the other piece that's always in a ball bearing uh, or in a rolling element bearing are either balls or whatever the other kind of rolling element you might have, some sort of a round part that's doing that. And then w there's an outer race, okay? So these are kind of the three parts that are the three components that are always part of a rolling element bearing. What I'm showing you here is actually all the parts of something that's even bigger, and that's something we've referred to in this class several times. It's a pillow block, okay? Wanted to kind of talk through that so that you have a better idea of what we're saying when we say pillow block. Um, kind of the key thing about a pillow block is that it also provides this housing part and that there's a relationship between the housing and the outer race of these, um, you know, these pillow block bearings such that there's this spherical surface and that spherical surface allows the inner portion to articulate angularly relative to the housing. Okay? And because those two faces are shaped spherically and they mate with each other in that way, uh, it allows this part to, to kind of articulate and it keeps there from being significant uh, moment loads um, in, uh, in any direction on the shaft where the, the bearing is applied. Okay, we've talked a little bit in here about set screws and how we can use set screws to uh, affix one part to another part on a shaft. I uh, want to kind of mention here that uh, one of the ways that you can decide how you are going to use a pillow block bearing is by either deciding you will uh, install the set screws or maybe you will decide not to install the set screws. If you install them, what does that do? Okay, it'll, it'll affix basically the axial direction, right? If you install the set screws, kind of the presumption there is that the set screws are going to keep the uh, shaft from moving axially if those are installed. If you leave them out, then what it does is it allows the shaft to actually slide axially relative to the inner race of the pillow block bearing, okay? And how that has relationship to the problem that we're about to solve, you might notice here that um, I specified for this problem that we're about to solve that one of these bearings, bearing B, is going to be carrying thrust, okay? So that, the way you could kind of interpret that is that maybe someone installed the set screws in that bearing and, uh, and did not in bearing A which by the way, that's probably a good idea. We might remember back when we were talking about shafts that uh, we typically do not want more than one bearing carrying axial loads in a shaft. The reason for that is that if you uh, have more than one bearing carrying axial load, then any sort of misalignment of where those bearings are located will create axial forces in the shaft that are unnecessary. Like it's basically one bearing working against the other bearing. So. Uh, we are basically specifying for this problem that bearing B is going to be carrying the thrust, meaning that it might have its uh, set screws installed. Um, going back to the idea of this pillow block bearing, you might notice here that um, these balls are actually held in place, held where they need to be um, angularly around the perimeter of where they are supposed to be located. They are typically held in place by something that's referred to as a retainer or cage for those balls that keeps them all where they need to be. This actually was a, um, I don't know if you've ever done this, but you know, before I learned about this stuff, I was always kind of amazed at ball bearings, wondering how they built them. Like, how do you put this together, right? It seems almost like an impossible thing to put together. Well, one of the ways they do that is they load all the balls into one side of the bearing and then put the inner race in place 
and then spread the balls back out to where they belong and then put this retainer in place that makes sure the balls stay where they're, where they're supposed to be. Okay, so that's, you might even see, this is a very detailed drawing. It has these little rivets showing you exactly how the two halves of that retainer uh, attach together to hold all those balls where they need to be. So I just thought this would be interesting for you to see some of the details uh, of this. The other thing that you will usually see, um, for many of these bearings at least, you will see some sort of a seal or a shield or a slinger. Um, those are three different ways that you can try to keep dirt out of the bearing and keep lubrication in the bearing. Um, and so that's what you typically see that kind of covers up the balls and you don't actually see them for many of these, uh, many of these ball bearings. Uh, the other thing I'll mention here, because this is, uh, for a lot of you, you may end up going into a career where you're doing uh, like maintenance on machines. One of the key things that you have to maintain on many machines is grease in the bearings. And so there's a lot of times a schedule that is uh, kept for each bearing that's in a machine of when you might need to actually apply grease. And when you have to apply grease, there's often a fitting. Uh, this is a little, typically, I've heard these referred to as Zerk fittings or Alamite fittings. Those are actually, they are two different kinds of fittings, even though the terms are a lot of times used interchangeably in practice. Um, the, the more general term for it is a grease nipple. So there's a, a lot of times you can have a grease gun that will actually push grease into the bearing through that nipple. And there's, you know, there's a little hole in the outer race that would allow that grease to get into the bearing. So these are all things that are more practical, a little bit less uh, theoretical, but it's important for us, I think, to have some idea of how these things work. Um, before we get into the problem, let me also actually talk about another arrangement that we can have for bearings. And you may have seen this before as well. Uh, what we see over here is how bearings are oriented uh, for a trailer axle or for many, many automotive applications do kind of a similar thing for their bearings. You'll notice this is a different kind of bearing, okay? This is a, uh, usually referred to as a tapered roller bearing. The advantage of a tapered roller bearing, the, the kind of the big advantage, is they provide a very large amount of um, resilience to thrust loads in one direction. Of course, that is only one direction that they provide that um, resistance to thrust loading, um, in addition to really high radial loads as well. All right, so that's kind of an advantage of these. Um, and uh, one of the other things I wanna point out about how this is set up, in the first example we had for the pillow block, you would expect that the center, the inner race, would be rotating while the outer race would be stationary, right? That's how you would expect that that would work. And so if you put a load on the uh, inner race, that race will be turning relative to a fixed outer race. The other way that you can um, have a situation like this is for the inner race of the bearing. That's how this works with respect to an axle. The inner race of the bearing is stationary while the outer race is rotating. See how that works? Um, and this actually has an interesting implication that we're going to see in the middle of this problem. All right, but I wanted to kind of bring up that there are a couple of different ways that you can implement uh, these bearings. Um, what you actually see with this picture, where I got this picture is there's a product out there that allows you to fill a little cavity really full with grease with a spring that sort of slowly pushes that grease into the axle and keeps the axle from uh, seizing up or something like that. Actually, a matter of fact, I was driving on the interstate yesterday and I drove by a uh, semi truck that it was a, it was a car hauler semi truck. So a whole bunch of cars on this thing. Well, the wheels, uh, it looked like it had total failure of all of the tires on one side of the trailer. And it kind of brought to mind, I knew I was gonna be talking about this today, it brought to mind one of the most common failures that you see on trailers is that the grease in the bearings, uh, people just don't think about maintaining that. So after a while, grease is gone. And uh, then after a while, once the grease is gone, the bearings can heat up and the, the bearings can actually heat up so hot that it gets the wheel so hot that it can start the tires on fire. Uh, and so that's not an uncommon trailer uh, accident, you know, source of an accident for that. As a matter of fact, uh, a buddy of mine's father is a contractor and uh, he had that happen on one of his trailers one time, and almost lost the whole trailer and truck and everything. It was uh, evidently pretty bad for a while, but they did get it under control. 
because once a tire starts burning, uh, it's really hard to put out. All right, let's get into the actual problem that we have for today. So what we have here is a shaft um, that has a six inch diameter um, sort of wheel on it. And we're gonna assume that we have a consistent 850 pound load applied in a particular direction. That direction is given with the little slopes that I've uh, identified right here. So for every six inches of rise in the Z, we have four inches of run along the X and two inches of run along the Y. So that defines the direction of that force. The reason this is kind of significant is that because that force has this interesting direction to it, um, it will end up creating not only radial loads in the two bearings that hold this, the shaft, it will also create uh, a thrust load in at least one of the bearings or else it will just slide. Okay. So that's, uh, you know, we have this load, we have to deal with that thrust load and we're going to identify bearing B as the one that deals with that. We have a few uh, parameters that we're going to try to hit. We want to have 95% reliability, meaning 95% uh, of the time, our predictions here will, uh, for how long it might last, uh, will be right. Um, we have that it's going to operate at 110 RPM. Uh, we are planning on replacing these quarterly. This actually brings up a good point. Um, when you have uh, contact between two parts, and you might remember this from when we covered contact fatigue uh, in the previous course, but when you have contact fatigue between parts, there is no endurance limit, all right? There is no such thing as this endurance limit where it will last forever, all right? Um, it will fail at some point if you have something like that. And so when you have components like uh, ball bearings, it should be your expectation that they will have to be replaced at some point because they have contact stresses that are cyclical within them. All right, so that's kind of the basic theory that goes behind all of this stuff. And so we're gonna replace these quarterly to, to uh, account for that. We want to have a design factor of 1.3 for, uh, for this part. And uh, this last thing, we're gonna assume that the catalog data that we have for these bearings are based on uh, a life of 10 to the sixth revolutions. Okay, and we'll see how that uh, plays into what we have to calculate here in just a few minutes. All right, so where do you think we ought to start with a problem like this? Okay, so we probably need to figure out the, the forces in the bearings, right? It's kind of the suggestion I think I heard is that we need to figure out the amount of force uh, in each of the bearings, bearing A and bearing B. Well, that's just a statics problem, basically. Okay, so let me do this. I'm gonna actually show uh, a couple of free body diagrams. So let me do first one free body diagram viewed from the top, okay? Which basically means that, uh, you know, I would have X pointing this way and Y pointing this way. Okay, if I'm looking at the shaft from that direction then where will I have reactions? Okay, well actually, let me start. What direction will I have an applied force? Okay, the, the applied force is gonna be happening, you know, basically uh, in this plane, it will look like the force is happening like right here. Okay. Do you agree with that? All right, and rather than put it that way, let me actually uh, split that up and say I will have some um, Y component of force due to that 850 pounds is being applied there. And then I will also have a, an X component of force that's being applied from that 850 pounds that I have up there, okay? Um, Given that those are the directions of force that are, are likely to be applied at the little uh, wheel that's in the middle of this shaft, what do you think the reactions are gonna do at the uh, supports? Okay, so we have reactions like this with another reaction that happens 
right here. Okay. Um, I should actually mention this. I kind of breezed through it a little bit. Why is it that I can put these forces right on the shaft instead of showing them uh, somewhere else? So keep in mind, I'm looking at this thing from a top view right now, right? Yeah, so once I get into the other plane, I might need to do something else. But in this plane, because this point is directly above uh, the position of the shaft, then in this plane, I'm not going to see anything different than if these forces were applied right at the shaft. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so we have 850 pounds right here, but not the full 850 pounds. What would I have to do to figure out the component that would be applied uh, in this direction? I probably need to take a ratio of 2 over what? Square root, 6 squared plus 4 squared plus 2 squared. See that? I'm picking off just the component that's applied in the y direction, which is going to be associated with that 2 that I have in that slope indicator. What about my, uh, my x direction? OK, that's right. Same thing. The only difference is the numerator is going to be 4 rather than 2. So it looks like I may not have drawn my arrows proportionately, but we'll just let it be. All right, so here we've got 4 over the square root of 6 squared plus 4 squared plus 2 squared. OK, here let me call this RAY. This I'll call RBY. Here, this is RBX. Uh, okay. Now, I'm pretty confident that once you have in mind what the free body diagram should look like, that you guys are fully capable of solving for reactions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say dot, dot, dot right here. Okay, and so we don't spend a whole bunch of time on this. I'm going to tell you what these reactions uh, calculate out to be. So the first one is RBX turns out to be 454.3 pounds. Um, RBY turns out to be 145.4 pounds. And RAY comes out to be 81.79 pounds. OK. So this is just a matter of doing your equilibrium equations. Okay, and those are the results. But that's not enough. Why not? Okay, I actually need to look at the other plane as well, right? I need to look at the, uh, the plane that would be the, uh, let's see, the XZ plane for this shaft. Okay, there's a couple of ways that I can do that. I'm going to show you how I kind of think about it. I'll tell you what, I'm going to slide these down so we can see <clears throat> what that picture looks like. All right, so here is my XZ plane. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm going to look at this 850 pound force. And let me do this let me do a, an equivalent uh, force couple system. Okay, so when I do that, I actually think about this force, instead of it being applied where I'm showing there, it's like I'm thinking of it being applied right here. And when I do that, what do I need to add as well? A moment, actually two moments, all right, when I do this. One of them I don't really care about for this question. But one of them would be important if I wanted to solve for the amount of torque that I'm applying right here. Okay? If you think about that, 
I would need to know the, uh, I would say the Y component of force and multiply it by the radius of the wheel. And that would be what I'd use to get the torque being applied at the end of the shaft. Do you see that? So you take the, the Y component uh, applied to the wheel times the radius of the wheel, and that ends up giving you um, the, the torque that's being applied. I mentioned that because that's sometimes important. It turns out that's actually not an important thing for us to know for the question of sizing these bearings. So I'm gonna kind of ignore that one, but I'm gonna go on and look at the other implications of that 850 pound force. So let me say this is the Z direction. This is the X direction. And now I'm gonna say, uh, let's look at the uh, Z component here. And then we will also have the X component again. Okay. Now here's the thing, that X component, we've already solved for that. That's not part of what we need to accomplish in this one. All right, this isn't enough though for the applied forces at the wheel. All right, why not? I'm doing an equivalent force couple system. And so what else do I need to apply? Yeah, well, a, an applied concentrated moment here due to the force that's being uh, applied right there. Okay, so it's like a, a moment that's being applied around this, this location right here. So let me actually put in these. So this, this uh, is going to be 850 pounds multiplied by, um, I need the component in the Z, so that gives me 6 over the square root, 6 squared plus 4 squared plus 2 squared. Okay, for that direction. The other direction, like I said a second ago, I have already uh, calculated what that horizontal component is in my previous step. So let me just put that in as being, uh, what did it turn out to be? RBX, 454.3 pounds. Okay, now what direction do you think the reactions will go for this shaft in the Z direction? Okay, this way, right? To react against the uh, applied force in the middle of the shaft there. Okay, so this is gonna be R, B, Z, and this is going to be R, B, or R, excuse me, R, A, <clears throat> Z. All right. Now, what's the magnitude of this uh, concentrated moment that I have right here? Okay, what I need to do there is take the, the X component, which is, again, going to be 454 point three pounds and multiply by what three inches okay so this is this is what we use uh, in order to figure out the reactions at locations B and a okay so I'm going to do the same thing again say after doing some equilibrium equations, uh, we come up with uh, RAZ is going to be equal to 218.1 pounds. Uh, RBZ uh, ends up being 463.4 pounds. <clears throat> and we already knew the, uh, the axial component, which is the uh, RBX. So that was already 454.3 pounds. Okay. All right. So I kind of set this up this way because this is a lot of times how information comes to you whenever you're doing a 
a question of how to size your bearings. We haven't really learned anything new just yet, right? We just, this is a lot of times what we have to start with in order to get moving with the rest of the problem. Let me ask you a question. Do these bearings, do they care what the ratio is between, let's say, an, a, a Y component and a Z component? Right? They don't care how much of it's in the Y and how much of it's in the Z. What do they care about? Yeah, they're, they're going to be probably sensitive to an axial force and a radial force, right? And that's exactly how equations in this chapter are set up, is to deal with radial forces and axial forces. So we don't have radial forces actually solved just yet for this, um, for this problem. How do I get the radial force in the B, let's say? Maybe I'll label it like this. Okay, the radial force for bearing B, how do I get that? Well, the radial direction is the combination, go back up to our picture up here, the radial direction is a combination of Y and Z. Okay, so we need to take our Y and Z reaction for B, okay, so I'll start with Y, 145.4 pounds squared plus the uh, Z direction, which is 463.4 pounds squared. Okay, so the radial direction of reaction that happened, or the radial uh, component of reaction that happens on bearing B uh, winds up being 485.7 pounds. Okay, and we kind of need to do that same thing for the bearing at A, right? The radial component of uh, force that's applied on bearing A for this situation is going to be uh, 81.79 pounds squared plus 218 Point one pounds squared. So the radial component of reaction that I have there uh, is 232.9 pounds. Okay. We need one other thing as well, right? The, the bearing at A is not going to be carrying a thrust load or an axial load. Um, those are interchangeable terms, right? A thrust load or axial load. Uh, but the bearing at B is going to be carrying both a thrust load as well as radial loads. So we need to probably specify that as well. So the reaction at B in the axial direction, it, what is that? It's just 454. 0.3 pounds. I don't need to combine uh, anything together to figure that out. Okay, so now I have a radial and axial load for bearing B, and I've got a radial load for bearing A. All right, now we have to get into our newer stuff to deal with. Okay, um, we're going to start with bearing A because it's easier. Right. Bearing A has a purely radial load applied to it. And so what I'm going to do is show you how you can pick out a bearing from a choice of bearings that is going to be appropriate for uh, the amount of load that bearing A has to withstand. Okay. And your, uh, probably your best friend with respect to this question comes on page 570, there's an equation there, equation 1110, okay? So let me actually write this equation out and I'll talk about it a little bit. C10, all right? This is uh, sometimes known as the dynamic load capacity of a bearing. Um, sometimes they call it, 
I'm trying to remember, it's got a few other names for it, but it, I believe its primary name that they usually call it is a dynamic load capacity. Okay? This is a rating that comes from the um, manufacturer. And equation uh, 1110 says that you find this with a design factor, they call it A sub F, times a design load. So that's like how much load uh, it needs to carry. And this is then going to be multiplied by, uh, this is called, you know, your X sub D factor up there is basically a design life ratio. And this is going to be divided by several other parameters. Uh, X naught plus theta uh, minus X naught. This multiplied by 1 minus uh, R sub D. I'll talk about each of these parameters here in just a second. Taken to the 1 over B. And all of this raised to the 1 over A. All right. Now let's talk about each of these factors for just a few seconds. So the first one that I'll, I'll say right here, A sub F, this is a design factor. This is kind of uh, similar to a factor of safety. Okay? They don't call it a factor of safety because it's not technically a ratio of applied stress uh, to a strength of a material, right? But it is one of those things that allows you to make a factor that gives you some buffer, right? Gives you some space um, that you're not designing right up to the point where you think it's going to fail. Okay? Uh, this, is, this right here is the design load. Okay, that's basically how much radial load does the bearing need to be able to carry. Okay, um, the uh, factor up here, I think I named it a second ago, the, the X sub D. This is the design life ratio. This is essentially the ratio of the number of cycles that you need the bearing to be able to live divided by how many the bearing was rated for, okay? Because the thing is, load and life are related to each other in bearings, right? So when you have ratings, you have it at a certain number of cycles, right? And so basically what this is, is you have to take the ratio of the number of cycles that you need the bearing to live divided by how many cycles were used when the bearing was rated. Does that make sense? So that's the design life ratio. Now, these are the interesting ones here. Um, these are called Weibull parameters. I think it's two L's. So the thing is, uh, these bearings, how long they last is actually kind of statistical in nature, right? One of them might last a lot less than the, the other one might last. And so these are Weibull parameters that are provided by bearing manufacturers that allow you to kind of deal with those uh, statistical, uh, you know, the statistical nature of how bearings will tend to fail. So that X naught is a Weibull parameter. The theta that we have right there is a Weibull parameter. You know, obviously the X naught that's there is also the X naught that's back here. But then the other one that we have to use for, our, or you know, kind of identify as a Weibull parameter is that B that I have right over there. Okay. Now, what do you think R sub D is? Okay, this is a design reliability. Okay, so that's, in our particular problem, that is something that we are trying to shoot for a particular reliability. And we plug it in right there for our design reliability. Okay. And then the last one that we need to talk through is um, this little factor up here, 1 over A. Okay. Uh, 1 over A is a function of whether you have a ball bearing uh, versus a roller bearing. Okay. The nature of why, you know, and, and actually let me. Let's flip back there, and I'll show you where they have that. Uh, page 566, it's not numbered as an equation, but there is a little statement in there that says 
that we're going to use an A value of 3 for ball bearings and 10 thirds for roller bearings. Okay, let me explain why this is. With ball bearings, the contact patch between the ball and the race that it sits in is essentially circular. Okay, the reason for that is that the ball, as it depresses into the face that it pushes against, it actually creates a, a uh, deflection of the material right there at the point of contact and you end up with a circular patch of contact between the circle and the flat spot that, you know, you can kind of think of the race as having a flat spot there. So the shape of that is roughly circular. What do you think the shape of contact is for a roller type bearing? It'll be more rectangular, right? Um, and so that actually is what creates the difference in what we use for that factor of 1 over A up there on the uh, numerator of this equation. All right, so what we can do with this C10, right, I didn't label that, but this is our, our uh, dynamic load rating. Okay, it is measured in force, right? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what kind of a dynamic load rating we think we need for bearing A, okay? And uh, then from there, we have a chart or a table, excuse me, in here where we can look up that dynamic load rating and pick out a bearing. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug in some numbers here. <clears throat> C10, and again, this is for bearing A. So C10 is going to be equal to we wanted that design factor of 1.3. That was just a given number. Okay. What do we need for our uh, design load? Yeah, we need the radial load for bearing A. So that radial load was 232.9 pounds. Okay. Now we get into this fraction right here. Design life ratio, okay? For this, remember, this is the number of cycles that we need for the bearing to withstand divided by how many it's rated at, okay? So let's actually do maybe a, a sidestep for just a second here. How many cycles do we need this to withstand? Okay, so we're going to replace these quarterly. What does that mean? every three months, right? Or four times a year. So if you want to get like super picky on that, you take 365.25. That's how many days there are in a year. Okay. And we'll divide that by four. But then what? Okay, so we need to take that and multiply by maybe 24 hours a day. And maybe 60 minutes in an hour. Okay, so right now what we have is a number of minutes that the, uh, that the thing will run. How do I get this into cycles? Okay, 110 revolutions per minute. And a revolution is a cycle, right? So that should uh, basically do it for us there. Okay, and so if I c compute this out, I believe it have it here somewhere. Uh, this gives me 14.464 times 10 to the sixth. <coughs> cycles. Okay, so I have that and how many cycles were my bearings rated at? That was also given up here. Okay, we're going to assume that our catalog data rates these bearings 
okay, at a million revolutions. Okay, so what that means for our design life ratio is that we're going to have essentially 14.464, okay, over one, right, for my design life ratio. Because there's, you know, the 10 to the 6 basically divides out. All right. Now here's where this gets even a little bit more interesting. Um, we need these Weibull parameters for the uh, for our bearing. I want to show you this. Um, one of the more strange tables in the book. I'm looking at this one right up here. Okay. What they try to do in this textbook is they try to give you a flavor of what it's like to have to look through manufacturer catalogs, right? And they have actually identified, well, they haven't identified two manufacturers. There are two manufacturers out there that use two different methods of rating their bearings. One manufacturer uses 90 times 10 to the sixth as where they rate their bearings. Another manufacturer uses 10 to the sixth, okay? And so we are probably dealing, if we're using 10 to the sixth as our value, we're probably talking about this manufacturer. By the way, that table, if you're curious where that table's located, it's at the very end of the chapter, right before the uh, uh, exercise problems, table 11.6. Okay. And so this is where we can get x naught. X naught turns out to be 0 0.02. And theta is 4.459. Let's get those in here real quick. So x naught is 0 0.02. Uh, we're going to say plus uh, 4.459. Okay, minus 0 0.02, and then all of this times 1 minus, our reliability we wanted was 95%, so we put that in here as a 0.95, and all of this will be raised to the 1 over B. B was also in that table, 1.483. And all of this is taken to the 1 over 3 because we have a ball bearing as opposed to a roller bearing. And that was that A value is 3 if you have a ball bearing. It's 10 over 3 if you have a roller bearing. All right, and I think that gives me just about everything. When I calculate it all, I end up with 870.4 pounds. Okay, and that, what that can be interpreted as is that if we need a bearing with 95% reliability that'll last 14.464 times 10 to the six cycles, um, we need a bearing that will last, or that, that can hold, or that bearing will hold 870.4 pounds. Well, where do I use this? I go to table 11.2, okay? Remember, 870.4 pounds. I have 11.2 right here for us to look at. What's the first thing you notice? This table doesn't exist in US units. Part of the reason for that is we're using metric um, bearings. And so you'd expect that it'd have all in SI units there. This is not uncommon for us to have to do some conversions when we get to this point across unit systems. So let's actually go back and do the conversion to kilonewtons because that's what uh, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll multiply here by 4.54, right? 4.54 pound or newtons per pound. And then how many kilonewtons in a newton? 
or newtons in a kilonewton, maybe is another way I should say it. Okay. This winds up giving me, um, let's see now. I think I've got it right here. 3.872 kilonewtons. All right, so with 3.872 kilonewtons, I can enter this table and I can look for a deep groove bearing, okay? And the table only goes down to a 10 millimeter bore. So basically the question I've got to ask is, am I good using that 10 millimeter bore? I might be able to go, go lower um, if you actually have a more complete um, catalog than this, then you might end up specifying a lower value, but it's no more complicated than just making sure that your C10 value is adequate for the bore that you have, okay? And we'll limit ourselves for right now to the types of bearings that are uh, laid out in this table. This is not telling you that there, don't, there, there are no such thing as bearings with smaller bore than 10 millimeter. I'll just say for what we're given, let's just choose a 10 millimeter bore limiting ourselves to this table, okay? So 10 millimeter bore uh, ball bearing that we choose for this. Okay, well that one wasn't too bad. Let's get into the next one, okay? Um, bearing B has to carry not only a radial load, but also an axial load, or thrust load, as we can say sometimes. All right, well, how do we deal with that? The first thing we need to look at when we're trying to answer the question about what to do about combined loading in a ball bearing, that being both radial and an axial load at the same time in a ball bearing, the first thing we need to understand is this chart right here. So <clears throat> what this chart right here is basically showing, you might see that uh, the vertical axis shows this interesting equivalent force. That's actually what we're trying to get um, you know, out of this question. There's an equivalent force right there set up in this little fraction. And then down here, there's a ratio that is basically how much axial force you have relative to how much uh, radial force that you have. And the interesting thing about this chart is what you notice is that <clears throat> with this ratio of axial to radial load, um, experimental results have basically showed that you can have some amount of axial load right here um, that really doesn't affect the life of the bearing at all, um, as long as that load is relatively small but it reaches some value that uh, this curve kind of bends over and now that axial load start to uh, make more and more and more of a problem in terms of the life of the bearing. And you see that by basically this uh, equivalent load starts to rise as you begin to add more and more uh, axial load. So there's this fraction, uh, they identify it here as E, right? And there's this kind of a break point where does it matter whether you consider the axial load or whether you can uh, just kind of ignore it? Um, so with our question, what we probably need to do is we probably need to uh, figure out what that fraction is for our problem because for what we need, we're going to have a fixed ratio of FA and FR. But then we have this interesting value of V that is also in this question. And so let's actually take just a second and talk about what this V factor is. Um, v is a factor that accounts for an interesting uh, phenomena. Remember, uh, what causes bearings to fail is uh, contact fatigue uh, within the bearing. And contact fatigue is interesting in that, you know, there again, there is no uh, endurance limit when you're dealing with contact fatigue. And V deals with um, trying to determine if there's a uh, difference in like how the bearing is set up to rotate. You might remember the example we did earlier 
uh, we had both the trailer axle and then we had as another example uh, just like a pillow block bearing well with the pillow block bearing the inner part inner part uh, would rotate and the outer part stayed still whereas with the trailer axle you had the outer part rotating while the inner part stayed still so let's actually look at those two uh, possibilities down here okay let's say here we have the inner rotating okay well with the inner rotating let's actually try to identify the areas of the two races um, that actually experience your highest values of stress all right um, think of it this way we're in either case let's say that we're loading the middle part let's say that the middle parts pushing down like this and the um, the outer race pushes up like that when that's the case there are going to be balls that exist right in this little range between the inner race and the outer race and because those two races are trying to push together it's going to be those surfaces that experience the highest amounts of contact stress so i'm going to actually draw a little zone in here and say what if you know kind of in this zone you have your highest values of contact stress well that basically means that there's a little section of the outer race that is not rotating this is the material that all is going to experience that highest uh, amount of contact stress remember the inner race is is rev revolving you know all the way around and so when you look at the amount of material that uh, experiences those highest amounts of stress it's going to be shared around that entire perimeter okay well let's look at the other possibility where the outer race rotates okay and let's do the same thing where you know we are still putting a load like this and maybe we're reacting against that load uh, against this bearing right here but now the outer race is rotating so again you're still going to have this zone that experiences the highest amounts of contact stress because that's still going to be the area where the balls react uh, between the inner race and the outer race but now you might notice this inner race will not rotate and so the only amount of material of the inner race that experiences those high amounts of stress is just that much that I've highlighted right there. Whereas the outer race, that basically shares those highest values of stress around the entire perimeter. All right, why does this matter? Well, um, that V factor right there, basically um, its job is to try to account for the idea that when the outer race is the one that rotates you end up with an extremely small amount of material that is going to continuously get you know a large number of these uh, cycles of stress in a very very small amount of material and this makes the uh, case where we have the outer race rotating different than the case where we have the inner race rotating bottom line is we are uh, given the information in the textbook that for the case where the inner race rotates we should let v equal one and the case where the outer race rotates we should let v equal 1.2 okay um, and that's based probably on a lot of experimental testing and so we're going to kind of just use that result without a lot of question all right well now that we know that um, Kind of what do we do next with that information? Um, the, the suggestion that I have as far as the next piece um, of the process is to go ahead and calculate the, uh, that ratio that we had mentioned just a moment ago. For our problem, uh, we do have the inner race rotating. All right, and so that means that our value of FA divided by V times FR is just going to be equal to this axial value for uh, R sub B, which was 454 from earlier in our process, 454.3 uh, pounds 
over our value of v is just 1 uh, multiplied by uh, this 485.7 pounds. And this is, for all cases in our problem, our value of E. Okay, And this calculates to be 0.935. Okay. Now, what we do with this is we actually need to use the, uh, the information that's over here kind of shown graphically on this chart the way we use it is actually given the information that's in uh, table 11.1, which I'm showing right here, in conjunction with equation 11.9, where we basically plug in um, the values that we have over on the uh, right part of the chart, right? So over here, this is for the case where axial force does matter. Um, seems like a kind of a, a clunky way to do this but they did it this way to where they said basically by all of the x1s being 1 and all of the y's, y1s being 0, you're basically saying axial load doesn't matter for that data. So if you plug those in uh, into this expression, um, then you're basically saying your whole equivalent load is just radial load. That's not our situation because you'll notice that the 0.935 is uh, going to be greater than these uh, kind of threshold values regardless of where we are in the table. You'll notice that uh, our, these threshold values only go up to 0.44, which is a good bit less than 0.935. So no matter what we do in our question right here, axial load is going to matter. All right, so that's kind of the first step. The next step you'll see is we can't, it's hard for us to tell which of these sets of uh, parameters we should use for the coefficients in equation 11.9 until we select this ratio of axial load to what's called the basic static load rating C sub 0. Okay, And this sets up a situation where we actually need to do an um, iterative process. So, you know, those are not always the funnest things for us to do, but uh, sometimes it's important for us to sort of select what might be a solution and then check it and then refine our, our picking of the solution that we would want um, you know based on the results of that check and that's what we're going to do here so the first thing we'll do is we will start okay since we picked a 10 millimeter bearing for the last part of the problem let's just start with a 10 millimeter bearing um, for this one as well, bearing with a 10 millimeter bore. Okay, well if we start by thinking that we might be using a 10 millimeter bore, well then we can look up this C sub zero value out of uh, table 11.2, and I have that right down here. Okay, uh, 10 millimeter bore, we can look up C sub zero, remember we do have a deep groove bearing, so we can look up C sub zero, and it is 2.24 uh, kilonewtons as that load rating. Okay. So when we remember what we're trying to find here is this ratio of FA over C sub zero and FA that we see up here is gonna be the reaction at B in the axial direction. So 454.3 pounds <clears throat> uh, divided by, I believe we had 2. Point, what was it again? 2.24 kilonewtons. Since these units don't actually jive well with one another unless we have some sort of uh, conversion, we'll go ahead and do that conversion now. Uh, there are 4.45 uh, newtons in a pound and there are a thousand newtons in a kilonewton. So when we get ready to do this calculation what we find 
is that this ratio becomes 0.902. Okay. Well, so now we, we end up with another, I guess, sort of kind of a problem here uh, because the highest that this table goes is up to 0.56. Here's my recommendation. Um, my recommendation is that if you're above this 0.56, uh, then go ahead and just use that highest value in the table. Um, and so what we find there is that we can take x2 to be 0.56 and y2 to be 1. Plugging those into our equation for the equivalent radial load, which is this F sub e, it gives us that we have uh, 0.56. Remember that v value, which is uh, how we account for whether the inner race rotates or the outer race rotates, is just 1 and then F sub R, that is the radial load at B, so 485.7 pounds. Okay, and we're gonna add to that 1.00, it says right there, okay, times the axial load, and the axial load was 454.3 pounds. Okay. Now you might notice in here the, the load, the equivalent um, force here, is uh, radial force, is going to end up being in pounds, and I don't really want it in pounds. I would rather have it in uh, newtons or kilonewtons. So I'm going to go ahead and apply a couple of factors here. 4.45 newtons per pound again, and 1,000 kilonewtons are in a newton. Okay, and this allows me to find an equivalent uh, radial load. Uh, what I compute there is 3.231 kilonewtons. All right, well now we can see whether or not our 10 millimeter bore that we picked is going to be adequate uh, to last the number of cycles um, that uh, we need to, to act. How do we do that? Well, we actually need to plug it in to the same type of an expression or equation that we did for bearing A because you might remember bearing A had just a radial load in it. What we've done now is converted the, the load that's in bearing B into an equivalent radial load and so that basically means um, the number that we use there is appropriate to just plug it right in here. So I'm going to copy it and bring it up here. Okay. And the only thing that I need to change in this expression is just the amount of load. So it's going to give me, I'm going to put in here an equivalent radial load rather than um, the actual radial load. So 3.231 kilonewtons, okay? And if I plug this in and compute, that ends up giving me 12.074 kilonewtons. Okay, remember C10, this is called the basic dynamic load rating and it is basically how much load um, we need for this thing to be able to carry so that it lasts the number of cycles that we want it to last at the reliability rating that we need. So this allows us to enter the catalog again, which you know this table 11.2 is kind of our stand-in for what might be a real bearing catalog. And we look over to C10 and we see that we would have 5.07 well, that is not going to work because we need 12.07. So that's not going to work. Where should we go? Well, my first um, response to that would be to move up to a 20 millimeter bore. Okay. 
So that's kind of our next step. Moving to a 20 millimeter bore, we have 12.7 for the C10 rating and 6.2 for C0. Okay, so I'll say here next, try 20 millimeter bore. Okay. And so what we do there is, remember what we did last time, we started with this ratio. This up here, remember, was the axial load over the static load rating. Um, and so we'll do that again. Uh, remember the axial load is 454.3 pounds. Now we're going to take this over 6.2 kilonewtons. Okay, again we'll we'll need to multiply this by 4.54 or 4.5 uh, newtons per pound, <clears throat> and thousand newtons in a kilonewton, just like this. And the new ratio that I get, um, having done this computation, it ends up giving me. 3.26. I, I said that wrong. 0.326. Okay. So now there's a, a couple of options that we can do here um, as far as how to handle that ratio. 0.326. Um, you know, probably the the best thing to do is to linearly interpolate within this table. You would look between these two values and you would linear, linearly interpolate for the um, parameters that we have in here for that slope. Um, I will say that um, as I look at this, it appears to me that the larger value you have for either of these um, coefficients, the larger you are going to predict your equivalent radial load and that's a more conservative thing to do. And so what I say is that um, you know, it's probably fair enough and won't cause you too much of a difference if you just slide up a little bit and choose, um, you know, the one that has the higher values for those coefficients. It's, it's a little bit more conservative and a little bit easier if you don't want to do the interpolation. So I'll basically just take those and use those to calculate an equivalent uh, radial load. Okay. So F sub E now is going to be equal to 0.56 was the first one times one uh, times, and I believe that uh, value there was 485.7 pounds. And then to this, I will add, okay, it got hard to see. 1.15 times the axial load, which was 454.3 pounds. Okay. And again, I'll take all of this and multiply it by 4.45 uh, newtons per pound. with a thousand newtons in each kilonewton. All right, so if we plug all of that in, it ends up giving us an equivalent radial load of 3.534 kilonewtons. All right, well, where do I plug that in? Again, we need to use that number to come up with a dynamic load rating that we would need to figure out what kind of a bearing would be appropriate to, to carry that. So we put in 3.534 kilonewtons into that same expression 
that we used before. And what comes out of that expression is going to be 13.207 kilonewtons. All right. With that number, we need to go back into table 11.2. Remember, we were on a 20 millimeter bore bearing. It looks like we've now gone a little bit out of what is okay for that bearing, and so we need to jump up one more size, it looks like. All right. And so you repeat the process one more time. You take 6.95. Okay, so that's kind of my next one. Next, try 25 millimeter. Okay, so for that, we again take that ratio of uh, 454.3 pounds over uh, 6.95 is what we have now, kilonewtons. Okay, just like we did before, 4.45 newtons per pound and 1,000 newtons in a kilonewton. This gives me a ratio of uh, 0 0.291. Okay. And you'll notice that because of how I did my last part of this problem, when I go to the 0.291 and try to go into uh, way up here into table 11.1, I'm still in this same row, okay? And so I still use the same exact values that I would have used before uh, for X2 and Y2. And because I'm using the same values there for X2 and Y2, you'll notice here that the outcome that I will have for F sub E will wind up being exactly the same as I had for my previous uh, step. And because I'm using, you know, so to get the same value from the previous step, I'll get the same value again for C10, and um, it, it means that my 25 millimeter bore bearing is adequate. if that makes sense. Because uh, basically I'll end up with the same exact C10 value I had before, and because the 25 millimeter bore bearing has a rating of 14, uh, and this also includes a, a design factor, so I'm not really worried about that, um, my 25 millimeter bore is adequate. You know, we've got a little bit of safety built in with that 1.3 design factor. All right. So one last little comment I want to make on this is uh, we just found that we want a 25 millimeter bore bearing on one end of this shaft and a 10 millimeter bore bearing on the other end. All right, so we just said 25 millimeter bore and up here a 10 millimeter bore. The comment that I want to make is you will often see in real machinery that um, in a system, you know, maybe something like this, um, even if one bearing is set up that it's going to be carrying a much greater amount of load than the other bearing, the makers of the system may still choose to put the same bearing on each end of a shaft like this. The reason that they might choose to do that um, it's it's a really nice thing whenever you're you know operating a, a machine or a plant or whatever um, if you don't have to have as many parts on hand so if it's a part that you know you're gonna have to replace uh, a fair amount of times um, sometimes it's more helpful rather than trying to reduce the size to as small as possible it's more helpful to just have one type of bearing on hand and um, you know not have to carry as many different kinds of bearings. Well, uh, I hope this has been helpful and uh, hope to see you on the next video. So long.